Welcome to the Shi Parasha study, Parashat Imor. This week we're going to see something very interesting and a little bit not fully resolved. And hopefully, if you have any suggestions, feel free to reach out. This week's parasha, we have the concept of the Migadif, the person who's Mekalil, he t- says Hashem's name, and he is deserving of death. So it says, He comes out. Where is he coming from? That's how the parasha is introduced to us. Rashi commenting there says, and he brings a couple of opinions. Rashi comments and says, the previous statement of the Torah, which was talking about and he started laughing. He says, what well, Hashem is going to eat bread that's nine days old because they break it on Friday. They put it down Shabbat. It stays there for a full week. And then only on the ninth day of the following Shabbat do they eat it. That's Kavod for a, shi- for a king. And then the other opinion says, no, no. He left, he left the Beit Din Moshe. He wanted to put his tent in the Nahala where Shevedan was. And they didn't allow him to do it. You shall the global talk with the table time. They tell him right, everything has to be according to the family, and only a mother is from Shevet Dan, who ben Ish Mitzri. His father was an Egyptian, and therefore we're not allowing you here. He went to the Beit Din Moshe, and Beit Din Moshe ruled against him. You have to follow your mother, uh, your father's Shevet, not your mother. Okay, fine, well, very good. So we have the story: somebody coming and is being Mekalil Shem Hashem. But he's agitated either because of lehem apanim or because of a stature in the camp. Now it's important to keep in mind the sivui, the commandment of lehem apanim. Rashi tells us early in the parasha is told to Am Yisrael after they finish creating the Mishkan, meaning where it appears in parasha Temor, uh, they were still in that week of the Mishkan, and we didn't move at all throughout Sefer Vayikra, so we're still in that week. Okay, they tell about lehem apanim. Very good. So that's that would be the second year in the months of. Nisan, when they made the Mishkan. Also, it works nicely if you say, we're talking about the story that happens after the counting of the camp, which happens, uh, uh, right? They count the camps, uh, the, the camp, and they set it up according to Shabbatim. Okay, so it makes sense. It's happening sometime in the second year. The first month, the second month, not a big difference. And why is it included in the Sefer Vayikra specifically? Probably because we're talking about the concepts of Kedusha, Emun al-Kohanim bin Aharon, and therefore there's this concept of Kedusha based on the lineage. Sefer Vayikra is dealing with a lot with the concepts of Kedusha, Tum'a, Tahura, and therefore this is a story that has to do with Kedusha, both Kedusha of the Shevatim, and also Kedusha of Shem Hashem. Works very nicely. However, she continues on, and it says, but in the Mishmar, they place him in jail. They don't know exactly what to do with him. So that she comments, and he says as follows, and here's where the story starts getting interesting. But in the they put him alone. They don't, they don't put the Mekoshesh with him, I'll explain in a second, because they're both at the same time. So who is the Mekoshesh that we're talking about here? The Mekoshesh is somebody in, in Sefer Bemidbar Peritivav, after the Hittim Miragelim, somebody who's gathering wood, one of the two explanations, on Shabbat, and therefore he's liable for death, but they weren't sure which death to give him, so therefore they put him in jail until Hashem answers Moshe exactly which mitah to give him. So they're both in jail. These stories really happening at the same time, says Rashi. They're both in jail, and therefore, okay, they keep them separate because... One guy, they knew he died. He was supposed to die. They just didn't know how. But here, the Megadif, they didn't know what to do with him at all, so they kept him separate. This could work well. Why? Because the Mekoshesh is a few months after Hedem Araglim, which is right around Tisha Av time of the second year. Okay, so you say the Mekoshesh is somewhat afterwards, then it works very nicely. So the guy, didn't, they didn't kick him out of Shevet then, let's say, right away. Well, he didn't hear about the mitzvah lecham apanim until a little bit later. Okay, fine. It works very nicely. That's because you're in two sefarim. Doesn't mean they can't really be happening at the same time. And you say the story of the migadif 
is brought in a little bit earlier because of related topics of Kedusha. However, where it gets weird is what Nashi comments as if it had been bought about the story of the Mikoshish. And uh, she tells us, This story, says Rashi, is speaking about the genut, the criticism of Am Yisrael, that they weren't able to keep one Shabbat, the second Shabbat, this guy comes and is Mahalal Shabbat. Okay, when is the second Shabbat? There's a mahalokim, what are we talking about? We're talking about after they were commanded about Shabbat in Mara and Parashat Bishalah before Har Sinai, or we're talking about after Har Sinai a few weeks later. Fine, but we don't, no big deal. Either way, we're definitely talking about the first year, the third month, the second month, or the third month after leaving Egypt. This person was Mahalil Shabbat. Isn't that what it is? Wait a minute. That she, you're telling me this story in Sefer Bimid Bad, which begins in the second year, is somehow all of a sudden going back a year and talking about a story that happened a year earlier. So there's a nice thing here that people try to make. Yeah, no, it's true. They say, yeah, that could work. And why would the Torah put in Sefer Bimid Bad and make it sound like it's coming after the story of the Menai Glim? And they explain because Shabbat represents the Berit between Hashem and Ami Yisrael. And Hashem is showing Ami Yisrael the Berit is still intact. Okay, so they put the story here, even though it happened earlier, so the reader of the Torah understands that the berit between Hashem and Ami still is intact, therefore, you're going to die. Even though there's Hedem and Aglim, it doesn't mean it's a free fall. Well, Hashem is still involved with Ami Yisrael. You have to wait 40 years to get into the land, but keep in mind, it's not a free fall. So the reader is reminded of the story of the Mikol Shesh. Really, it happened a year earlier, but what that means, you see, this is where it gets interesting. If the Mikol Shesh and the Megad, if the person occurs, uh, at the same time period, and if we're putting the mikoshesh a year earlier than what it is, it means we have to put the megadef a year earlier than what it is as well. And now we're in trouble because what is the megadef doing, complaining about where his his which shevet his tent is going to be if they only set up the shevatim in the second year? What is he com- making fun of lehama panim if they're only commanded in the second year? So now we have trouble. That she, what are you talking about? That she, you want to tell me now? Not only do I need to view mikoshesh, which is difficult enough to say it's really a year early and out of order, now I have to understand megadef is out of order as well, and the both of the first year, and now he has nothing to complain about. So here's this is where can and here's the question: Can we say that she has an overarching shita? Or that Rashi in different Sefarim with different stories can be inconsistent and they don't need to make sense. And that's the primary approach of the, a lot of the Mifashim that they'll tell you, no, Rashi is bringing down two different opinions and two different stories. Each story, one opinion makes sense based on the text, but when you try to merge them together, it won't make sense. You either have to say the Mikoshesh and the Megadef were at the same time in year two, of Sefer, of the desert, and the Mikoshesh did not violate the Shabbat Shania. Well, you say, no, the Mikoshesh violated Shabbat Shania, but the Megadef wasn't at the same time. As well. These are the options. And that's what a lot of the sub-commentaries of Rashi says. And the the greatest of the commentators on Rashi, lived in Turkey in the 1500s. So one of the earliest ones, the greatest ones, he was considered a Rishon. He says, no, there's a way to explain it. He knew about the Hamapanim, even though they weren't committed to do it, he knew about it. And they started setting up from the first year already. And they started setting up according to Shabbatim, because that's how they carried Yaakov Avinu's coffin. And that's how they set up in the Midbar, even though they weren't commanded to do so. Why would Beit Dino and Moshe kick them out? Interesting, but you have to say it based on this idea of going back from Yaakov. So this is something very interesting. When we ask the question, can we make it actually consistent how, if we do so, when the Shein Sefer Ben Midbar affects the story of Sefer Vayikra, affects the placement of the story of Sefer Vayikra, but if you take only because the Shein Sefer Vayikra said it's at the same time of the story of Sefer Ben Midbar, and the, and the Shein Sefer Ben Midbar put the story at a different time than we would have expected, and that creates a whole situation in trying to make fun, make sense of everything, so it's a lot of fun. Morning, Rashi, I hope you enjoyed, and I hope it was clear enough, Shabbat Shalom.